And I'm going to start a long way back, actually, uh, quoting a writer that I'm sure you've all read, Paul Fussell, you know, author of uh, that great book, The Great War and Modern Memory. This is not from that book, though. And this is the kind of quotation from him which I hope is going to frame, well, frame, frame the other stuff, I say. Um, this is what Fussell writes. He says that for the sensitive and highly literate especially, each modern war becomes harder to fight than the one before because of the constant augmentation of anti-war writing. So, it gets more and more difficult to fight every war because of the volume of anti-war writing. And of course, such a literature was not available for those waiting in those long, uneven lines to enlist for the First World War, as though it was all, as Philip Larkin so beautifully evoked, as though it was all just an August bank holiday lark. And you can see that Fussell has a case, in a way, uh, since the First World War, really, war writing has come to mean anti-war writing. And it's funny, the sort of persistence of cliché, really, whereby if a film comes out or a book, uh, critics will quite often praise it for being anti-war, uh, whereas actually uh, just a moment's reflection makes you realize that given all the stuff that's gone before, it would take a writer of some genius to come up with a kind of pro-war book now. Um, I guess what we do get, though, increasingly, there are elements of this in Patrick's book, but also I think it's very brilliantly conveyed by Sebastian Younger in his book, War, where he says, you know, you can you can claim that war is all sorts of things, but what you can't deny is that it's insanely exciting for the, for, for the participants. If, as he says, if you're involved in some kind of fire, for, fire fight and everyone gets out unscathed, then everyone is on an incredibly high. Um, if we go back to the First World War, it all gets to the literature of the First World War. I think it all gets a bit more complicating Dan Fussell, who obviously knows a lot about this stuff, that then he knows. If you take the two dominant writers of the First World War, one in prose, Eric Maria Remarque, um, author of All Quiet on the Western Front, and then Wilfred Owen in poetry, um, if we look at them, I mean, although Owen's poems were written during the war, obviously because he, he, he died very near its end, they only came to the attention of the public in... Um, in 1931, I think it was. In other words, they became public property not as part of a culture of protest, but as part of that huge culture of bereavement. And, of course, you don't need any great training in logic to see that you can't really be protesting against something that has actually ceased to exist. So, yeah, it's very important to bear that, that in mind, I think. Similarly, Remarks book is really a book not so much about the First World War as about the post-war state of mind. And now, of course, you can argue that although these books had their, th these works of literature had their origin in the First World War, they were also forward-looking. They were attempts to make sure that such a thing would never happen again. They were attempts to end all wars. Uh, but of course, Ironically, that was the animate, one of the animating principles of fighting the First World War, the war to end all wars, which famously ended with uh, the Treaty at Versailles, which was neatly summed up by somebody as the peace to end all peace. Um, so I think on closer examination, it turns out there's a bit of a flaw in Fussell's argument, especially when we start looking at that, uh, at that sort of interwar mood. I mean, George Orwell pointed out that after the armistice, the, the anti-war mood was such that even the men who'd been slaughtered were held as being in some way to blame for their own deaths. Uh, Christopher Isherwood, born a year after Orwell, he, there's a nice line from him, we young writers of the middle twenties were all suffering more or less consciously from a feeling of shame that we hadn't been able to take part in the European war. Uh, the war, the First World War, which Isherwood had missed out on, it was a subject, he said, of all-consuming and morbid interest, a complex of terrors and longings. Uh, so what happened, I think, for the Orwell-Isherwood generation, they became conscious of the vastness of the experience they'd missed. And one of the attractions of joining up for the Spanish Civil War, Orwell claims, is that it was so like the Great War. Uh, Philip Toynbee, 
uh, a veteran of the Spanish Civil War, he recalls that Owen's poems, and I quote, produced envy rather than pity for a generation that, that had experienced so much. And he remembers, as someone in the, I think in the 1920s, he remembers murmuring the word Passchendaele in an ecstasy of excitement and regret. Even in our anti-war campaigns of the early 30s, this is Toynbee again, we were half in love with the horrors we cried out against. So that's a, that's a bit of context, but then we can, in, we can enlarge the context still further by quoting from uh, a book that was written in the period between the two world wars and which came out during the Second World War, Rebecca West's great book, Black Lamb and Grey Falcon. And she addresses near the end of the book the fundamental problem, which is, she says, only part of us is sane. Only part of us loves pleasure and the longer day of happiness and wants to live to our 90s and die in peace in a house that we built that shall shelter those who come after us. The other half is nearly mad. It prefers the, it prefers the disagreeable to the agreeable. It loves pain and its darker night despair and wants to die in a catastrophe that will set back life to its beginnings and leave nothing of our house save its blackened foundations. I think it's one of the really great observations there. And, I mean, I think it's so true. I mean, how else to explain that extraordinary footage which uh, crops up in all documentaries of one of the, the rallies quite late in the Second World War when I think it's Goebbels addressing the German people saying, do you want total war? And they, of course, all say, yes, we do, even though this is going to result uh, by then it's quite obvious in the complete destruction of, uh, of their country without some sort of acknowledgement of what Rebecca West says, it's very difficult to get any sort of grip on that, uh, what seems a kind of mass hy hysteria. But also I think we can bring it down also to the, to the level of the individual soldier about to, to enlist. Maybe not in the same way that they, they did in 1914, but I mean really people tend to enlist if, um, yeah, they tend to enlist in the belief that they're defending justice, freedom, their country from invaders, uh, terror, or, or whatever it might be. It's very rare that people actually uh, willingly sign up for some sort of attack. It's always in defense. Um, and people, people become disillusioned, but in a way they become disillusioned for the, I mean, the, the progress of any kind of war tends to be pretty well established now, I think. And people get, soldiers get, who signed up very willingly get disillusioned for pretty much the same reasons. They, dis, they, they, they find out that actually even something that is uh, very morally clear-cut becomes ethically complicated because among the casualties won't just be the bad guys, as, as Americans like to call them, but will inevitably be, be women uh, and children. Um, and also... I mean, as well as people joining up for noble reasons, a lot of people are, are, a number of people are, of course, joining up because they like the idea of killing people. I don't know if you saw that great documentary that was on recently about a U.S. Marine who'd been very badly injured in, um, in I can't remember now whether it was Iraq or Afghanistan, then of course he came home uh, sort of semi-paralyzed, and he was saying that when he'd gone up to, to join for the Marines, they said, why do you want to join the Marines? And he said, because I want to kill people. And they said, oh, that, that's great, but, uh, you know. Uh, and of course, then um, the disillusionment occurs when, of course, um, uh, sorry, let me, let me just mention something now about Ben's book. There's a, ter of the many terrific moments in it, there's a fantastic bit where this, aged well-wisher comes up to the, the members of Bravo Squad and he's sort of really sympathetic because they've seen all these terrible things. And he said, it must be difficult to, to live with that. And the sergeant steps up and says, oh, don't worry, these guys love violence. You know, they're, we're, we're the, this, this lot, they're the most murdering bunch of psychopaths you'll ever, you'll ever meet. Don't worry, don't worry about them. And uh, what happens, I think, is that the other form of disillusionment is People know that there's a good chance of getting killed or injured uh, during a war, but when it starts happening to your to your friends and colleagues, uh, then a kind of then inevitably a change occurs. I guess the archetypal thing in the popular imagination for this it would be uh, it would be Ron Novak as played by um, Tom Cruise in Born in, on the Fourth of July, and there's that. But I think 
we need to set, set that disillusionment in the context of what I think is the key scene in the film where Tom Cruise is, is getting drunk, he, he, he's paralysed, and um, he's in a bar, and he's sort of creating a, creating a scene, and there he, he meets uh, somebody, an, another Marine, who says, you know, sh you keep quiet, I was a combat Marine in Iwo Jima, and I'm, you know, so you can stop your whining and belly aching, all this kind of stuff. And this is a very useful reminder, I think, that people join the military, uh, well, let's put it like this, they don't join the military because it's going to be a soft job, because it's going to be easy, and particularly people join the Marines, it seems to me, precisely because of the history of kind of appalling conflict in the, in the Pacific, in Iwo Jima, all this kind of stuff. Part of the appeal of joining these, these uh, the, the, something like the Marines is precisely because it's been so, so, so horrendous. Uh, of course, we as readers are fascinated in this, and I'll just now say something very quickly as sort of build up to, to, Ben's, uh, uh, to Ben's book. Uh, the great books to come out of the First World War, that it, was, it was poetry and it was prose. Uh, the second, and there was a long, there was this delay before these books came out, about a 10-year delay. After the Second World War, we didn't have to wait long at all for Norman Mailer's great book, The Naked and the Dead. Uh, moving rapidly forward, it seems to me that the great book to come out of the Vietnam War was Michael Hare's Dispatches. I guess it could be argued that uh, a sort of counter-argument could be, actually, we've had to wait a really long time for the great book to come out of the, uh, out of the Vietnam War, it being Karl Marlantis. Matterhorn, but actually I really don't think it, it's a great book. To me that's just a, a sort of 19th century novel dressed up in sort of Mekong Delta costumes. Um, and the other great, uh, the really great novel to have come out of the Vietnam was of course The Sorrow of War by Bao Ninh, a Vietnamese uh, uh, writer. Uh, with the first Gulf War, I think we'd all agree it would be Anthony Swofford's book Jarhead. Um, so what's going on, I think, is we're getting this, mo this reduction in the, in the amount of time you have to wait for the books to result. Uh, and also you get a shift from poetry in the novel to, well, let's say, to, to memoir. And what's happening now with the Iraq and Afghanistan wars is that we've got this incredible, uh, really, really rapid emergence of reportage of the highest quality. Of course, this isn't, isn't, these aren't the first wars to have uh, generated reportage. We can go back to the Second World War with Alan Moorhead, whose great book, Eclipse, I believe, is still in print, and also to Martha Gellhorn's war writing. But really, I mean, the, the, the stuff that's coming out now, uh, and we've got to be honest, it's all American um, uh, for, all, for all sorts of reasons that we could go on, uh, go on to discuss later. But the great books, it seems to me, Evan Wright's Generation Kill, which was made into a wonderful TV series, Jim Frederick's book, Black Hearts, Dexter Filkin's amazing bit of sort of the collection of gonzo writing called uh, The Forever War. And for me, the very greatest book to have come out so far of the, uh, uh, of the Iraq War, uh, the, the Good Soldiers by, by David Finkel. I mean, a great, great work of literature. But the reason it's a great work of literature was made clear to me in an interview that he did where he said, this is above all else, it's a book of reporting. Each sentence reports a fact, and the next book reports another fact, and the sentence after that reports another fact. And it's because of that fidelity to the job of reporting, I think, that it becomes a great work of literature, not because he set out to write some book with uh, lovely sentences, all of which meant that I was in no hurry at all. I, I certainly wasn't waiting for the great novel to come out of Afghanistan or, uh, and Iraq. It seemed to me entirely superfluous. Who needs it? I thought. And then I read Ben Fountain's book, Billy Lynn's half Long Halftime Walk. Thank you so much. <laughs>